Hi, I'm John Smith, and welcome back to Kingdom Real. Thank you for joining us. This is part six, the last episode of Journey to Healing and Forgiveness. Can I tell you one more thing about your mom? Please. When God called me to leave, and we can talk about this more, but there's, there's a part of it that fits here. Yeah. So it actually happened on uh, January 6, 2002. Um, early in the morning, and then during worship, and then right after church, we quick ran home, got changed. Andrew was in this travel basketball thing, traveled into Nassau County, and we're standing on the sidelines, and we got about 10 minutes while he's warming up out of the court. And um, without all the details, what'd you get out of the message this morning? I asked her first, so she told me, and then what'd you get out? I says, well, God told me I was supposed to leave new life and go to a new thing he's going to show us. And her response was, I knew it! I almost go back to the table. <laughs> she says, and she says, I knew it! I knew it! I knew you were going to get that out of it. I'm going, oh, but I don't want to leave. She said that. She said that. <coughs> And then the third statement, which followed up after that, which I was really glad to hear is, but if that's what God told you to do, I'll go with you. Now put that in context. From the evening to May 10th, 1999, she is so deeply wounded. She says, I will never trust another person as long as I live. <coughs> Completely shut down, wouldn't leave the house, wouldn't go to the door, wouldn't answer the phone. Now, almost three years pass, three trips to Blessing Ranch, processing it on herself, and God tells us to leave finally, and she doesn't want to go. She wanted to stay. To me, that is such a powerful <coughs> example of God's healing, transforming power in both of us, individually, as a couple, as a family. I just think that's a powerful, powerful story that brings hope to a hopeless situation. And we're not the only people who have gone through tough things. Mm -hmm. There's so many people in our world today that have gone through such horrendous things, far worse than we did. So I just, my hope and prayer is that by sharing these stories, it gives others hope absolutely that god is real that he loves us that he's with us in the midst of our darkest most painful moments and he's the one who brings the healing and the restoration and the perspective and the ability to forgive and the freedom that we all crave for long for and need with a with a healed transformed heart and in my experience my emotional Spiritual wounds take so much longer to heal than a physical wound. Absolutely. If you cut your hand, break your arm, break your leg, that can get repaired fairly quick. When it's that kind of emotional wounding for any number of different ways, it's a much more difficult journey that typically people have much less patience for. You're still dealing with that? Why don't you get over it? Doesn't no, heal it's that a process. Quick. It doesn't heal right. that quick. You know, this is not just a broken arm. This is a wounded heart. Absolutely. And that takes time. And I feel like um, people can't see it, you know. Well, exactly. It, it, just like if your you arm's have... in a sling, compassion flows Absolutely. out. If you're depressed, people look like, well, what's wrong with you? Come on, right. get it together. Pull out of it. Yeah, you suck know? it up. You got this, yeah. you know. It doesn't work that way. Absolutely. So you had touched on earlier, and I just want to come back to uh, – how do you find the people that you work with through pastor care? How do you find the pastors and the you know ministry leaders? Uh, on, on, the, on the people that I'm serving or people that are right part now. of the... Yeah. Uh, it happens in a variety of ways. Um, I'm always listening and watching. So if I hear something when I'm meeting with a pastor, or I go worship there or something like that, I'm always listening to how healthy they are and what's happening. So a lot of times I'll just take them to lunch or breakfast afterwards and just be a safe place. I 
will pay attention um, and have others helping me on that. If they get word that so-and-so just got let go from the church, so-and-so just got fired or whatever, I will usually reach out and offer my services. Um, sometimes they accept it. Sometimes they don't. I don't know that anybody's ever been offended by me calling them and offering my services. Sure. Sometimes they, well, no, I, I have other people. Okay, that's great. I don't need to just didn't want you to be alone on this. Some people just really are amazed by that. I have, and then all the pastors, the hundreds of pastors that I've worked with over the years, they let me know when they know somebody who needs it. Oh, they awesome. experienced help, so oh, he helped me. Sure. And so several of the people I'm working with right now, that's how I found them. Mm -hmm. Other people that I've helped, they tell them. I have some denominational leaders that um, are aware of what I do and believe in what I do, so they'll ask me to work with some of their pastors. I not recently, but several times I got calls from Focus on the Family okay. and they would refer pastors to me to, where they had been on the phone a few times and we needed to go further. So a multitude of ways like that. So I just want to circle back kind of to the burnout now that we've kind of heard, you know, the whole story. Yep. What are some signs? What what does burnout look like? You know, maybe what it looked like in your life, what you know sure. of what it looks like in others. Yeah, it, it can vary person to person, but burnout, as I experienced it, and when I was in seminary, they first started talking about burnout. Okay. And I remember thinking, well, it didn't sound real to me. Mm. And I remember actually, I don't know if I ever said it out loud, but I know in my heart I'm going, well, I'd rather burn out than rust out. In my mind, you know, I'm not going to be a lazy pastor. I'm going to be doing, obviously, it wasn't. And uh, I thought burnout was kind of a joke. I didn't know it was real until I experienced it. And depression can be part of it. Just a, a, an overwhelming sense that you're inadequate in every way, that you don't have what it takes, you don't measure up, um, I'm not as gifted a preacher as that person. I don't have the administrative talents of that person. I don't have the leadership skills of that person. I'm just average Joe, average John, whatever. And so it's really easy to get into the comparison game, mm -hmm. which is deadly. Oh, yeah. And both self-comparison to others and then other people's comments like, Oh, you know, so and so on the TV sure was good this morning. Hope you got something for us. You know, it's like, oh, great. Um, now I get to <laughs> measure right. up with that. Those things would happen. Uh, for some, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning and do things. I never really experienced that side of it. Um, but as I'd mentioned before, the joy getting sucked out of your life, the things that you used to love about ministry all of a sudden just weigh you down. And I remember probably one point that's clear in my mind that I was struggling with that was, um, oh man, how do I get into all that? But it, the thing that's popping into my head now was after 9-11, <clears throat> I was actually on a long overdue sabbatical, came back a little early, and um, had three sets of meetings with different leadership groups in the church. I had a meeting with the staff, a meeting with you know, all the elders and deacons, and then ministry leaders. I had these three meetings, and in all three meetings, I said, wow, we've been through a lot. Thank you for all your service, and so on and so forth. Um, talk to me about what your experience was. And in all three meetings, there were, to my shock and surprise, there were several people that were really angry with me because on the Sunday after 9-11, I didn't do what they expected from their senior pastor. Which was what? I was scheduled to be someplace else, but I came and I, I called into the church office. I called my associate pastors who I'd put in charge. You want me to come into the office? No, we got it covered. Want me to be there for the service on Sunday? No, we got it covered. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, with mommy being in charge of the video team, we gave the video crew the day off. And so I says, you do the directing. I'll be on a camera. And I think Matt was on the other camera. And uh, we'll just film it. So we got there early. 
And I was just hugging, crying with people until the service. And then uh, we filmed it, went back down nonstop with people till we filmed the second service, then nonstop people afterwards. So I was there for, I don't know, five or six hours. And, um, but what I found out was in many people was because I didn't come into the sanctuary and because I didn't go up on the pulpit and just be there for a minute or two and say, we're going to be okay, everybody's fine, that type of thing. That's what they needed. That was what they called leadership of their senior pastor. And they're not totally wrong, but I was trying to honor the other folks and also to do what I do best, to be there to comfort and encourage other people. I actually had no desire to preach that Sunday. I'm sure. If I had to, I would have. But my associate could hardly wait. He was so excited to be able to preach that Sunday. And, and one of my two friends who, you know, spoke in a lot of different churches, it was a horrible Sunday for him because he had no place to go preach. So I began learning quite a bit about myself in that process, where I was at. And then in each of those three meetings, I learned a few people at each one were mad at me, which surprised me. And then they had a whole list of stuff that wasn't going well at the church. And as I listened to that, for the first time in all those years, it just was really hard to hear. In the past, anytime I'd hear stuff like that, well, hey, we could do this, we could do that. I always had ideas. I was full of energy. Oh, well, let's try this. And that time I was like, no, I can't do this. And I began to think, they need a new leader. They need somebody who doesn't have all the baggage that I do. I just felt inadequate and too tired and drained to do it. When the complaints and the problems about this and that and the other thing, I was like, oh, okay, I've heard that before. I don't know what to do. And it was just, it was so strange for me. I'd never had that before. I was just like, oh, man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And, and then I started thinking, like, I think it's time for somebody else. They, they need another leader. I, I can't do this. And um, preaching became harder and harder and leading became harder and harder and creative ideas weren't coming like they were in hindsight looking back at that those are all key indicators of burnout mm -hmm. and it was it was more real than i anticipated it could be and i remember actually because of my earlier journey and reading books on it. And in that second week of Blessing Ranch for me, we dealt with a lot of the issues of depression and burnout and what was going on more than the first time. So now I'm coming, and, and, he, and he was teaching me, you know, some, some things like, well, when you feel it coming, when you see, these are some strategies, some tools you can use. And, and I was using the best I could, but it really wasn't working too well at that sure. point because it just kind of came back with a vengeance. And once again, it was like, I got blindsided by it. I just, I did not, go into any of those meetings, I just did not expect that to happen. And it was like, wow, okay. But God still hadn't released me. And I'm going, come on. <laughs> and, um, and then a couple months later, he did. But I had to complete all the forgiveness first. I had to experience again, I think, the depression. Mm -hmm. And so that at the point of release, that was good. And... Um, we could talk about this on another time, but there was, a, there was a key thing that happened during my depression. I read another book for the second or third time, and that, pre no, for the first time. And that prepared me that when he called me to leave, I could make it all official on the same day. And if I hadn't read that book, the whole book in two or three days, I wouldn't have had the courage or understand the need for doing that. And my fear was, if I didn't make it official on a one day, I might talk myself out of it later. Sure. 
And I'm so glad I didn't. It was absolutely the right decision. And at that point, God clearly, through Scripture, through prayer, and through the message that somebody else was giving that day, now's the time. Because at that point, I was, um, other than the, the depression, I was healthy again, the church was healthy again, and now it was time to release. And that's where that last piece of freedom came. And it was after that release, I watched the second half of Shawshank Redemption for the first time. And when I saw it, I go, that's me. That's how I feel. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like the weight of the whole world had finally been removed from my shoulders. I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. I can finally leave and go home. And that was precious. I'll never, ever forget that. Amen. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Incredible. You're welcome. Appreciate it. My pleasure. So, thank you for being part of Kingdom Real. We value you. Hopefully this is a good experience for you. I'm John Smith saying so long until next time.